Feels like it's been a long time after doing four in February and one early in March, but it's nice to have everyone back with us. Today I'm coming to you from Treaty 6 territory in Leduc, Alberta. I would like us all to take a second to just think about where we are, where we work, where we play, and pay a little bit of homage to um, the people who have been here long before we have, if we're settlers. So before I begin, I would like to introduce Dr. Dave Martel. Um, Dave is a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto. He is also one of the leads in the Canada Wildfire and Search Strategic Network. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Dave for, oh boy, let me think, I think back to 2011, um, and lucky enough met him prior to COVID in person. So I'm really happy to have him here today. He does some really interesting work looking at air tanker analy analytics, um, very data heavy stuff that, that I always find very interesting. Um, but today he's going to be talking to us about air tanker management analytics. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dave to do a quick introduction and start his presentation. Um, he's going to talk for about an hour. We will have a QA and a at the end. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat box. And then I will read them out to Dave at the end of his presentation. And we can kind of start <laughs> off the Q&A from there. So thanks, everyone, again. And over to you, Dave. Thank you, Karen. I assume you can hear me. Uh, good morning. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to thank Canada Wildfire for accepting my suggestion that I uh, offer this webinar. And, and of course, to Karen, who's been looking after all of the, the, the logistics. And thank those of you who've uh, been able to attend. I realize it's a busy time of year. Uh, researchers are out starting their field camps and field work and uh, people in fire operations are out there dealing with fires in some place. So uh, this is gonna be recorded. So if you, if if you have friends and colleagues that uh, couldn't make it, then uh, they can get the recording later. So first I'd like to acknowledge the, the land on which I'm speaking from. Uh, basically, I'm at the University of Toronto and the University of Toronto operates on, on land, which for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the year on Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still a home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And uh, coincidentally, uh, I was at a prescribed burn at High Park yesterday, and a group of Indigenous people participated in that burn, so it made that particularly special. Okay, so, so what are my objectives today? Basically, what I want to do is reach out and, and share with you uh, the results of some of the air tanker related decision support systems research my students and I have been doing uh, for a number of years, uh, primarily in collaboration with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, I hope to convince others to pursue uh, research in this area. Sorry, I'm trying to get my uh, stopwatch going so I keep on time. And I and hopefully I convince some of the fire personnel in the audience to collaborate with those researchers that choose to do so. And I, they're, they're, the, the fire research community has expanded enormously in, in recent years. And uh, we're, we're very fortunate in that. We're not so fortunate in the, in, in the primary reasons it's happened. There's been a lot of fires and that's what's drawn a lot of people to work in fire research. But this is kind of my view of the fire research community. Uh, there's the, the traditional fire behavior people who, who study basically the physics, chemistry, rates of spread of fires. And I'm thinking of people like Brian Stocks and, and Mike Watton. There's fire ecologists out there that are studying the ecological impacts of fire. For example, Sylvie Goche and Jennifer Beverly. Uh, there's been an increasing uh, number of people that have been drawn into fire from basically the social sciences. And I sort of classified it as the human dimensions of wildland fire because fire has been, as you know, been having uh, a lot more impact on people than what was typically the case in the past. So examples of people there are Tara McGee, Tara McGee at the University of Alberta and Amy Christensen with the CFS. I work down here in what I call the fire management systems area. So my background is uh, my formal education is in industrial engineering. I, I develop mathematical models of fire management systems 
the objective is to hopefully uh, develop decision sorts support systems that managers can use. And examples of other people that are working this in, in this area are Elbin Lee, University of Alberta, and Dennis Boychuk with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in Ontario. Uh, so what is analytics? Well, in, in some respects, analytics is a, uh, a new buzzword for quantitative methods. And, uh, uh, you know, think Moneyball. Everybody's either read or saw the movie or heard about Moneyball. So, so that's kind of the, the stuff that I do. Uh, that's the new label for what I do in any event. And uh, there are basically four categories. Of, of analytics, descriptive analytics, basically gathering data and displaying it to, to try to describe what's actually happened in the systems in which you're interested. There's diagnostic, why did it happen? Basically trying to identify the causal relationships that are, that are contributing to things happening. And predictive, uh, given the, 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 uh, the need to uh, manage these systems that we're interested in, to, to what extent can we predict what will happen in the future? And in particular, uh, predict what will happen if certain steps are taken, which sort of trends into prescriptive uh, analytics. And essentially, uh, what, what should you do to achieve some objective? So, so when I'm interested in predicting, I'm, almost, I'm interested in predicting what will happen in the system if the managers that implement this particular measures or some others to try to achieve some objective. And, and, and in the fire business, we're talking about things like, uh, you know, ecological impact, uh, economic and social impact. So as I said, that's where I tend to focus most of my research. So my early accomplishments, and I'm going to say my, I'm talking about work that I've done in collaboration with students and people in fire organization, primarily in Ontario. But uh, we developed something that we call the fire arrival, the daily fire arrival assessment program, which is a bit, uh, an example of predictive analytics. Each day uh, in the province of Ontario, the sector response officers or their SROs submit to the regional duty officer their subjective assessment of how many fires, person caused and lightning caused fires they think might happen in, in their sector. And those are incorporated in the SOP, the Strategic Operating Plan, and uh, informs the planning process within each region. Uh, another example of early work that we did is work that I did primarily with Dennis Boychuk and others within the Ministry of Natural Resources, we call the Ontario Initial Attack Model. And that's very much a prescriptive analytics task. And I'm going to refer and come back to that later uh, this morning. And some work on air tanker home basing that I did with a graduate student, Jim McCullen. And that too is an example of prescriptive analytics. Some more recent accomplishments. Uh, fortunately, I've been able to collaborate with Mike Watton and uh, we've been developing daily lightning fire occurrence models. Uh, and uh, before that, for many years, I started working on human caused fire occurrence. And most recently, I've been doing some work in collaboration with Doug Wolford. So those are both examples of, of predictive analytics. And then we have the, the uh, other work, and I'm not going to talk about it today other than to mention here, uh, in collaboration with Colin McFadden, who was then at the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario, developed what we call the Daily Aerial Detection Demand Index. And I put their prescriptive question mark because it's essentially what we do is we gather predictive data about where, when and where we think fires will occur spatially distributed across the, the landscape, the regions, and, and a measure of the uh, values at risk if fires occur based on the occurrence and the weather and the fuel and the values at risk. And that's intended to inform decisions about where is it important to send aerial detection patrols? You don't want to send them to areas where the public is going to quickly find fires uh, for free. You want to focus on the areas that the, that the public's going to miss. So basically an overview of my talk, and I excuse, I'm very much old school. When I use PowerPoints, I use a lot of words, uh, unlike my students who uh, manage to 
communicate their thoughts and ideas using much more uh, appealing graphics. So I'm going to talk first about my view of forest and wildland fire management objectives. Then I'm going to talk about the initial attack system as one of several fire management systems. Then I'm going to talk about the use of air tankers and air tanker management decision making. And then I'm going to drill down and, and start focusing on, on the initial attack system. And I'm going to talk about the initial attack system as a, as a service facility. And I'm going to talk, and, and as a society, we're full of all kinds of service facilities. So I'm going to try to think about what lessons can we learn from what people have learned when they've studied those other service systems and see to what extent we might be able to apply some of that knowledge to the management of air tankers. Uh, I'm going to talk about some unimportant, uh, some important unsolved air tanker management problems. And as a researcher, you're not going to be surprised that I'm going to say we need, we're going to need more research. Then I'm going to talk about uh, ex examples of how we might better exploit some of the data that's currently available. Uh, even before analytics arrived on the scene, uh, technology has made it possible for fire organizations and others to collect a lot of data. And uh, in my view, not all of it has been fully exploited to develop decision support systems. And then I'm going to end up with some closing remarks. And with it, depending on how much time we have, and I expect we'll have adequate time, uh, we can have a discussion. And I would encourage comments, questions, and suggestions. So I like to start most of my talks talking about forest and wildland fire management objectives because there's a lot of discussion out there about things like uh, you know, to what extent suppression has altered landscapes, which it certainly has in some areas, and to what extent suppression is important, and to what extent we should continue it on it. So, so uh, that, of course, depends on what part of the world you're sitting in. But, but uh, there's one thing that's very obvious and certainly applies across Canada is, is that fire exclusion, which is the sort of the historical roots of fire organizations in Canada, Fire exclusion is no longer economically or, or ecologically acceptable. And given my background, my formal education as a, an industrial engineer, I sort of look at fire management and I draw on what people in logistics talk about. And, and I, I do this for two reasons. One is because they've developed a lot of knowledge that can be used to manage the systems they deal with. But the term supply chain, uh, even before COVID hit, the term supply chain uh, became very, uh, very front and center. And of course, everybody now knows what supply chains are and everybody now knows how important it is to manage supply chains. So one of the things that people that do logistics and manage supply chains talk about delivering the right things to the right place at the right time at the right cost. So when I think of fire, I think about fire as deliver, fire management is delivering the right amount of the right fire to the right place at the right time at the right cost. So as I said, basically when I think of fire management, I look at it from a supply chain logistics perspective. And, and I think the, the, the objective of fire management organizations is to deliver the right amount of the right fire to the right place at the right time at the right cost. And I'm gonna move this window over here a little bit there. Okay. Uh, and obviously right depends on time and place and it depends on social, economic and ecological objectives. That, that of course vary over time and space. So some places we need a lot of suppression, some places we don't need any, and some places we need to uh, walk sort of the middle ground where, where some fires are allowed to burn and some are suppressed. And obviously th this poses very difficult challenges for which there are so few simple answers. And certainly when you talk about uh, fire personnel that are managing fire on a daily and hourly basis, it uh, certainly complicates and makes their jobs more, much more interesting and challenging than they were in the past. So sort of step back and think about what are some of the fire management subsystems that have been developed to, to deal with the 
delivery of, of these uh, fire management programs that are designed to achieve these objectives. So we talk about fuel management and obviously fuel management we've not done a lot of in this country until recently, but it's become perhaps uh, one of the most important activities in which fire personnel people are dealing with or at least providing advice because of the need to carry out fuel management in particular around communities and other infrastructure. Prevention programs have always been very important and detection programs and initial attack has always been very important and, and large fire management. So all of those systems uh, are important components of an overall fire management system. And as I said, I'm gonna to talk today about initial attack systems and I'm gonna talk in particular about the use of, of air tankers or the decision-making that's associated with the use of air tankers in uh, initial attack. So I like to start by going back to something that uh, George Parks developed many, many years ago. Uh, and this is kind of like my sort of version of, of what he developed. This is based on his PhD thesis and it was published. It's basically the first paper on, on what we call operations research or analytics, prescriptive analytics, back uh, many years ago. Uh, and I, it was based on his PhD. So I like to uh, sort of adapted his ideas as follows. But basically, we're interested in, in, and if you look at the bottom of that diagram, we're interested in the timeline from when a fire is ignited until it's declared out. So fires are ignited, they're detected, they're reported, you dispatch initial attack resources, they arrive at the fire, they begin suppression action if things are successful. They eventually bring the fire to a state of being held, eventually under control, and then it's declared out. So if you think of a simple fire uh, uh, burning on flat ground and homogeneous fuel in the absence of wind, it's going to burn in something that looks like a circle. And uh, But if you start suppression action, then you're going to gradually slow the growth of that fire and it's going to trend down. So Basically, the final size of that fire is going to depend on these time intervals, and I guess I should apologize for this mathematical jargon, but but uh, people that develop these models use the word use the Greek letter tau to denote time. So there's a detection time interval that's basically the result of how well the detection system is managed. There's a deployment time interval that's a, a function of how well the daily deployment activities take place and a suppression time interval that is the result of how the initial attack dispatch and suppression tactics take place. And then you obviously have mop up. So if you can, if you can decrease the time of any one of those time intervals, then you can reduce the final size and impact of fires that you don't want to be burning. Uh, so most of my work is is dealing with the uh, the daily deployment and also initial attack dispatch and suppression tactics. That's what I'm most interested in. But what I'm going to be talking about mostly today is on the daily deployment. Okay, so let's step back and think about what are initial attack system objectives. So. Basically, the objective of the initial attack system is to minimize the number of potentially detrimental fires that escape initial attack. And I say potentially detrimental because when, when, when the dispatcher or the duty officer is deciding what to do with a newly reported fire, uh, he or she has to make a decision. Is this a fire that should be suppressed and how aggressively should it be suppressed? And, and ultimately, uh, you're only interested in suppressing the ones that are potentially detrimental. So there's some subjectivity and, and some quick uh, assessments that have to be made there. But, but of course, response time is critical, uh, particularly when fuel, weather, and topography support rapid or potentially rapid growth near high value areas. Uh, and, and the objective is to contain the growth of those potentially destructive fires reasonably quickly. And I, and I use the word reasonably because that doesn't mean you pull at all stops. It depends on, on uh, what resources you have available, the cost of those resources, the potential impact of that fire. And at, at, at any time when the duty officer is making those decisions, he or she has to think about, well, what might also happen sometime in the not too distant future? So there's a lot of interesting, challenging decision-making going on there. 
Okay, so let's talk about the use of air tankers in wildfire management. Air tankers play an important role in many parts of Canada and in other, in other countries as well. And uh, people in the fire business know this, but not everybody outside it does. But basically, uh, air tankers don't usually extinguish fires, but they, they, they buy time. They tame the fire. They reduce the size, the intensity, the growth rate uh, of the fire that's eventually handed over to the ground crews in Ontario, they're called fire rangers, unit crews in some provinces, but but eventually those are the the, the people that eventually contain and extinguish the fire. So air tankers are used in both initial and extended attack, but but today I'm going to be talking about the use of air tankers in basically in in initial attack. So as I've said earlier, most of my research has been done in Ontario in collaboration with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, and air tankers play a major role in fire management in Ontario. Uh, they're both costly and they're also effective. Fortunately, I've got some uh, photos of air tankers from other provinces. And uh, here's some, some photographs from uh, British Columbia. And the one on the top left is uh, is a fleet of fire bosses skimming water, and and I was, I, I asked Eric uh, for a copy of that uh, because I was particularly impressed with those aircraft uh, when I was on a fire in West Kelowna. Uh, they they come over in a fleet and they basically uh, a couple of minutes between them, and it's just one after another, and they're totally synchronized. And it's quite impressive to see them in operation. And there's a picture of them actually picking up, and you can see that the that they're staggered and they're picking up, so they'll end up dropping on fires shortly thereafter. Uh, the top right is a Conair Q400, which is dropping land-based retardant, which has got uh, red dye in it, so they, they know where it's landed. And down below, there is a, an Electra. Dave Schroeder sent me some pictures from, uh, from Alberta, and the top one is a Lockheed Electra, and the uh, top right is an air tractor 802, which is land-based, which is uh, being used for, for retardant dropping. And the bottom is a CL215T, which is a turbinized version of the old piston engine CL215. So the question is, why are air tankers used to support initial attack operations? Well, first of all, uh, response time is critical and they can get there quickly. Uh, air tankers are flexible. Uh, they can be quickly called off or diverted to higher priority fires. So if, if air tankers have been dispatched to a particular fire and uh, the, the uh, duty officer has decided, well, I have higher priority fires where I need them, then he or she can divert, divert them very quickly to other fires. Uh, they can drop water or retardant on intense fires in front of which you just definitely can't put ground crews because of safety concerns. And uh, there's another important thing that, that not everyone realizes is air tankers or air tanker groups usually come with an experienced air attack officer, and he or she can assess the fire behavior and the fire's potential impact. So it's an important set of eyes and, and brains over the fire that can inform the duty officer what's going on in that fire, and that can be used to inform decisions about, well, should I continue to, to, to source to, to uh, serve more air tankers to that fire or put them somewhere else. And, and my typical dot, 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 because there are a whole lot of other concerns uh, that, that, make, that, that make it, uh, that, that sort of drive the reason for using air tankers on initial attack operations. So I wanna talk about decision-making and decision-making happens over different time and spatial cases. cases. So I'm going to go from long-term strategic planning uh, down to minute-to-minute -minute planning. So, so sort of at the top of the scale is long-term strategic planning, the acquisition of air tankers. Basically, one has to decide how many of what type of air tanker do you purchase, lease, or charter, and, and share with other agencies because fire, fire resources are shared between provinces and, and other countries, of course. Uh, on a shorter scale, so so the kinds of decisions you make on acquisition, you're going to probably live with them for at least 20 years. Home basing is sort of a medium-term strategic planning set of decisions, where essentially 
the the organization has to decide where should the air tankers be home based each season and they're not made they're not they're essentially made each year but but in, i expect in most cases they don't do a lot of changes from year to year so but 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 you don't have to live with a home basing decision about where you're going to base each air tanker for each season for for the next 20 years if if uh if it looks like you need to shift where they're home based, then you can do so. Then we're talking about daily on a daily time scale. So the daily deployment and alert status of air tankers. So you have a fleet of air tankers. Where should they be put and what should their alert status be each day? And you can move them around uh, in Canada. We're talking about moving around from province with within a province from one, one base to another. And you can do that from day to day. And then when we're talking about initial and extended attack dispatching and reassignment of aircraft, that's done on a, basically on a minute to minute basis. So, so the duty officer initially when a fire is reported, if it's judged to be an air tanker fire, has to decide which air tankers, if any, uh, to send on initial attack and, and, and which should be assigned to uh, support extended attack on, on large fires. And then finally over the fire, You've got the uh, air attack officer who has to decide things like where are the pickup lakes, where are the air or the airports, uh, where are you going to ask the pilots to drop loads on the fire, those kinds of decisions. So basically, we have a set of scales going from decades down to minutes, and, and there are important decisions going on in all those, and I'll come back later and talk about how those are linked, uh, but I'm going to focus primarily on daily deployment and alert status. So I'm gonna give you some examples of some of the work that, that we've done and others have done over the years on analytics applied to various classes of these problems. So one of the first pieces of work that I did, uh, and it was done many years ago, was collaboration with Dennis Boychuk, who's now with the Ministry of Natural Resources. It was uh, what we call the Ontario Initial Attack Study. And it was initiated in response to a management board of cabinet directed that the Ontario Ministry develop a rationale for how best to update its then aging air fleet. Uh, Dennis and I developed a simulation model for the use of air tankers, firefighters, and transport helicopters. And that was used to inform the uh, management board submission from the fire program. And uh, we published this in a journal called Interfaces. And in order to publish papers in Interfaces, then you have to uh, get a, a letter of testimony essentially from the, the decision maker or the client or the manager that you worked with said, yeah, these people are claiming we use their stuff. They really did. So John Goodman did that. Uh, later, a few years later, Kelvin Hirsch and Rob McAlpine extended that model to create what they call leopards and that was used to address a number of strategic planning issues in Ontario. And Dennis Boychuk is currently developing Leopards 2, which will obviously be much better than, than either of the two versions that we did before. The second project was uh, air tanker home basing. So now we're talking about an annual kind of rather than a decadal type decision. Uh, and the province of Ontario uh, had uh, a number of air tankers and it had a number of bases and it was trying to decide where should they uh, base the, the home base the air tankers? And that's a difficult decision because when, when you're deciding where to home base the air tankers, you have to take into account that as the fire season progresses, you're going to be moving them around the province from base to base uh, for daily deployment duties. So essentially, in simple terms, what you want to do is you want to pick a good home basing strategy that will minimize the cost of moving air tankers around to meet daily deployment needs. So I was fortunate, I, uh, I had a graduate student, Jim McClellan, who was an experienced firefighter. And one day we got a call from the ministry saying, can you help us with this problem? We said, I said, well, I don't know. I, so I asked Jim, who was then a grad student and said, do you wanna do this for your thesis? He said, sure, and we did that. And, and that too resulted in some interesting implemented research that informed the, the, the home basing strategy at that time. Daily air tanker deployment and alert status. Basically, where should the air tankers be deployed each day and, and their alert status? And I'm gonna come back to that a little later this morning. Uh, 
initial attack and extended attack decision making, dispatching, and reassignment. Uh, basically, uh, which, if any, air tanker should be dispatched to each initial attack and extended attack fire each day. Basically, the duty officer decides that in consultation in Ontario with what they call sector response officers, incident commanders, and others. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone that's developed any uh, decision support systems that deal with that kind of decision. And, and, and I've avoided that for a lot of reasons, and we could talk about that during the question period. But basically, uh, my, my subjective sense is the duty officers do a pretty good job. Uh, I don't think it's worth my while to uh, spend a lot of time developing a sophisticated mathematical model that might produce a marginal improvement uh, I'd rather focus my efforts on other problems where I think I can make a, a significant difference. Uh, On-site strategy and tactics uh, were basically pick up lakes or airports, where each air tanker should drop, when to cease air tanker action. Uh, those kinds of decisions are made by the air attack officers and the pilots uh, in consultation with the incident commander on the ground. Uh, and I'm not aware of any implemented decision support systems, and quite frankly, I doubt there are any required, so I avoid that problem with the but like the plague. So let's return to the daily air tanker deployment problem. Uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario has a fleet of nine SEAL 415s and four twin otters on amphib floats. That fleet can and sometimes is augmented or diminished as a result of resource sharing agreements with other provinces. And the ministry currently has three primary bases and 11 secondary bases. So each day they have to decide where should they deploy their air tankers for initial attack on new fires and the alert status of those aircraft. And the alert status is basically how much time the pilots have from when they're told to go to a fire until they have wheels up and it goes, goes various levels of, of time intervals. So I want to step back and talk a little bit about queuing theory, which is which is some uh, sort of a branch of mathematics that, that I was taught and studied as a student. And, and basically, queuing theory is, is sort of a, a bundle, a class, a bag of mathematical tools that can be used to model the behavior of waiting line systems. So basically, you have customers. So you can think of bank customers arrive at a bank. Uh, they join a waiting line and or which we call a queue and there may be one or more servers one or more bank tellers or or bank banking machines and those servers process the according to some rule by by some rule i mean the typical service uh rules are first come first serve so this is a diagram and basically we've got and there we go back to using the greek letters but uh customers are arriving at a rate of lambda customers per hour they join the end of the queue. And there are, in this case, there are four servers that are processing customers. And in this case, all of these customers are, are, uh, are, are processing them at the same time. So th these queuing models can be used to predict things like the behavior of the system. For example, the average number of customers waiting in the queue, the average time they wait. And the, the the beauty of these models is you can see how those performance measures will vary if you alter the number of servers. So, begs the question, what might air tanker managers learn from grocery store managers and EMS managers? And uh, I picked that because everybody goes to the grocery store. So this is an example of a grocery store uh, checkout system. And uh, the the little green people and the green faces represent people that are that are waiting or being served. So, uh, at this particular store, there happens to be four self checkout count counters and then three cashiers. And all three cashiers are busy serving customers. And there's one waiting in front of number one, one in number two, and two in front of number three. So the next customer that arrives is a little sad because he or she realizes he or she has to wait. And so people would say, well, why don't they go to uh, self-checkout number four? Well, I'm guessing that this customer has got a, a large bundle and they would rather not use a self-checkout. So basically what happens is when customers have to wait too long, they get annoyed and they take their business elsewhere. Uh, so what the store manager has to do is to decide 
uh, basically, how many cashiers do I want to, to look after these uh, customers? Because uh, I have to, the more money I pay for cashiers, the more money it costs to run the store. But the ha the less happy the uh, customers that that are going to leave them, they're going to go somewhere else. So that's not unlike air tankers. Uh, sorry. So here's a here's a uh, an air tanker queuing system. So basically, fires are arriving. They join the initial attack queue. They get assigned to air tanker groups. So I got three groups here. One of them has uh, two air tankers and a bird dog. I, I know that's not a good uh, image for a bird dog, but that's the only one I could find that was a smaller aircraft. Uh, and I have a second one, which has two air tankers and a bird dog, and a third one, which has one air tanker and a bird dog. So basically, the duty officer takes and looks at the fires and the initial attack crew and assigns them to one of these service uh, units, an air tanker group, and the air tanker group processes, that is, fights that fire until they're, they're done, and then they go back home. Uh, sometimes you get a very high priority fire, so you will preempt a fire. So I've shown there that the fire that's been assigned to air tanker group three is not as important, doesn't have as high a priority as another fire that's arrived, so that fire gets bumped back into the initial attack crew, gets preempted. So when air tanker fires wait too long, they get annoyed. They grow larger and they cause problems. And uh, basically the regional duty officer has to decide how many air tankers do I have to hire, uh, put on deployment today at what alert status to keep my fires and my regional director happy. So things can get a lot more complicated. Uh, this is sort of an example where there's uh, three initial attack systems operating within a region, each one, each one of them at a different airport. And uh, there might be a single queue in front of each of them, or there might be one regional crew that uh, is dealing, that the duty officer says, okay, this fire is gonna be sent to this uh, one over here and so on. So, uh, basically, what do we have to know in order to, to manage these? Well, basically, uh, we have to estimate how many fires will be reported each day, uh, what fraction of those fires might require air tanker action, and uh, how are the fire arrival rates going to vary throughout the day and throughout the region. Uh, estimate the time required to serve each uh, air tanker fire. and we need a lot about information about aircraft operating characteristics. What's their flying speed to and from fires, a flying speed during pickups and drops and so on, and a whole lot of other information. And, and I'll, I'm gonna to return to this later when I talk about research needs. So my students and, and colleagues and I have been developing queuing models for a long time. Uh, I studied them first when I was a, a student in industrial engineering. Altithicott and I developed an air tanker deployment variant of an earlier model uh, that a guy called Jim Bookbinder and I developed on helicopter deployment. Uh, Julie Fortin studied air tanker operations in Quebec and Kazi Islam, uh, another graduate student developed several queuing models. So implementation eludes us. Uh, people are interested in this stuff, but they're not using it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the daily deployment problem in a little more detail. So basically, uh, the daily deployment problem is you have a set of air tankers, you have a set of bases. Which air tankers do you deploy at each base? What's their alert status? And what's their initial attack radius? And fortunately, Kazi Islam studied this and developed some models and found something which, uh, in retrospect, was, was obvious to the people who we were working with. He found what, what probably everybody in the fire business knows is on a busy day, you have to tighten the circles and you can't afford to send air tankers out too far from the bases. So later, Kazi worked with me and a guy called Martin Posner in industrial engineering and developed a, a much more sophisticated model uh, using something called the hypercube queuing model. 
and he used a simulation model to validate that model. He found near optimal location for F servers. So you have a number of air tankers and you can decide where to put them across the, the landscape. And uh, basically that model could be used to help develop and evaluate static start of the day air tanker develop deployment strategies. It could also be used to develop myopic redeployment strategies. So you, you start off by positioning them someplace at the beginning of the day and fires get reported and air tankers are busy. So how should you reposition them during the day? Uh, and, and basically that model has yet to, yet to be implemented in Ontario. Uh, and anywhere else. So there's basically no expressed desire for these kinds of decision support systems on the part of the regional duty officers. Ontario is quite willing to support this kind of research, uh, and uh, but but they're not using what we're doing. And uh, but there's a bit of a, a, an interesting opening. Uh, one of the regional duty officers in Ontario has recently said, "Well, maybe you could develop a model that we could use to evaluate coverage." So I kind of said, well, maybe that's an emerging desire for some simple air tanker decision support systems. So we fortunately have one in the bag. Uh, we've been working on this for a number of years. Uh, so we have uh, a model we call Tanker, which is a daily air tanker deployment model. And, and basically it embeds a simulation model in a larger, uh, a larger decision support system so basically, if you have forecast weather and forecast fire occurrence, the idea is to use this to evaluate daily deployment strategies. So a couple of screenshots, this is a map of Ontario and you can see the little black dots are airports and the, and the purple uh, circles represent radii of, of air tankers, uh, attack radiuses of air tankers positioned at those airports. So essentially, uh, what we can do is we have a, a, a user interface where the user can go in and look at all of the actual airports that are available to host air tankers and can specify which air tankers are going to be placed at which airport and what their initial attack strike range will be and what their alert status will be. And then the simulation model can be run and, and predict the performance of that strategy. So one of the things that's obviously interest of, of interest to me, and I think of interest to them, is uh, going to be the, the simulated average response time. So in, in this case, uh, these, these uh, grid cells represent uh, cells where at least one fire uh, received air tanker action, simulated air tanker action during the run. The shading of the cells show that basically the green are the better ones where the response time was quick and the orange where the response time wasn't so quick and the yellow is sort of in transition. But there's other things that you can pull out of this model. Uh, uh, so for example, maybe uh, you can look, this, this is another map of the system and it basically shows the average number of fires per ADDI cell. So this is goes back to this, uh, we're, we're using the same set of cells to model where we think fires uh, are going to occur and need air tankers. So, so basically the, the green ones show where, where there were fires that were supposed to receive an air tanker and, uh, and those that, that, that the, uh, the number of fires that didn't so basically, you can see that there's an above average number of cells north of Armstrong that didn't receive air tanker action. There simply wasn't enough air tankers uh, to, to respond to all of them that were deemed necessary. Uh, so the question is, maybe there's a need to do, redeploy air tankers because there's an, there's an air tanker, there are air tankers at Chaplow, but there's not a lot of fires that, that didn't get serviced and and there's air tankers at Armstrong but not enough to deal with all the fires that needed servicing so so the idea is the duty officer looks at this and says well maybe I'll try a different deployment strategy and sort of spread the resources around in a in a better way 
So there are a lot of other important unsolved air tanker management decision support problems uh, for which I, of course, think decision support systems can and should be developed. One is initial attack dispatching. Uh, one is the on-site use of air tankers and uh, talk about modeling the hierarchical air tanker management systems. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on that. So basically going back to the er er earlier slide where I talked about long-term strategic decision-making and minute-to-minute decision-making. Well, because of that hierarchy, it makes the development and use of models uh, a bit of a challenge because basically what happens is decisions made at any one level in the hierarchy affect what decisions can be made lower in the hierarchy. And decisions that are made at any particular level in the hierarchy send up signals to levels above that says, basically, I need some resources. So it's very difficult to develop a comprehensive model that's going to cover all five levels of decisions. Uh, that's more than a bit of a challenge. So, so basically what happens is, is people like me develop decision support models that tend to be focused on one level. So essentially, we need to figure out from a research perspective, how do we deal with these link linkages in, in an appropriate way? So suppose you're interested in on air tanker home basing. So you, you want a home basing strategy that will minimize the cost of daily deployment activities that are going to be decided on by others below you in the hierarchy as the fire season progresses. So you don't want to include those people in your model to, to optimize or tell them what to do, you have to make some estimates of what you think they will do so you can do your home basing to minimize the cost of letting them do what they're going to do. So you have to guesstimate how you think the air tankers will be deployed, uh, not, what, not how you think they should be deployed. So you sort of focus on your level in the hierarchy. Uh, similarly, with daily air tanker deployment, you, you want a strategy that's going to help you focus on where should I deploy them, deploy them today, given how I think they will be dispatched as the day progresses. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a need for a lot of other research here. Uh, and obviously, I, I believe air tankers are both costly and effective, but I'm uh, not aware of many. Maybe, maybe even go so far as to say any significant peer-reviewed scientific publications that are consistent with that belief or that hypothesis. Uh, I believe the lack of, of, of that kind of evidence is due to a lot of things. One is that uh, air tankers tend to be dispatched to the, quote, more challenging fires. Sometimes they're used to support seemingly futile suppression efforts. Uh, and also, I, I don't think we've devoted enough time and effort to studying fire suppression processes. So, so how, how might we address that need? I think we as a community have quite rightly devoted a lot of time and effort to studying fire behavior. Uh, but I think it's time we also devoted more time and effort to furthering our understanding of the cost effectiveness of air tankers and other fire suppression resources. Uh, this is not new. Uh, Matt Thompson who's uh, an analytic specialist, uh, published a paper back in 2012, which is 11 years ago. And he said, quote, continued work is necessary to evaluate the effectiveness of large air tanker firefighting and more broadly of fighting, firefighting effectiveness in general. Uh, and uh, as I was preparing this talk, uh, Dennis Boychuk sent me a link. Uh, the Australian Natural Hazards Research Center has just issued a call for expressions of interest. And uh, this is a quote, I've quoted from it. How do we know that aerial firefighting operations are effective and efficient? Uh, they want to have some work done under one of the research themes. And I've highlighted there that was issued on April the 3rd of this year. Uh, so basically it's obvious that the people in Australia uh, are concerned that we don't know enough about the cost effectiveness of air tankers either. So fortunately, we have some people working on it. Ilman Lee and Jennifer Beverly at the University of Alberta have been studying air tanker uh, initial attack systems in, in Alberta. Uh, they've been analyzing the impact of air tanker drop amounts, firefighter hours, and helicopter hours on initial attack success. 
Uh, Melanie Wheatley here at the University of Toronto has been studying air tanker operations in Ontario. She's been using historical fire and, and air tanker mission data to model dispatch decision making, initial attack success, and influence of air tankers. And I'm not going to, I have neither the time nor the expertise to explain in detail what they've been doing. So I would refer you to them. They're, they're all, all three of those people are doing interesting research that, uh, is 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 some of it's been published and others will be published soon so so there is a light at the end of the tunnel at least at the end of my tunnel uh, i, I want to step back and talk about uh example i said earlier there's a lot of interesting data out there that we could use to learn a lot more so i'm sitting in my office one day and i get an email from el tithicott and it was very cryptic uh he attached this map and he said, I thought you might be interested in what our air tankers have been doing up near Timmins today. And I looked at that and I just, just absolutely fascinating. I had no idea of what was going on here. This is heartbeat data from the GPS units on the air tankers that were being used in Ontario. And you can see where they're, where they're going on circuits between lakes and dropping on fires. Absolutely astounded by this data. I had no idea it existed. Uh, so basically, the GPS data tells us where the aircraft was uh, every 30 seconds, its speed, direction, and altitude, but it doesn't tell us what it was doing. Uh, fortunately, I had a smart graduate student, Nick Clark, and he took that GPS data and the fire report data, and he parsed the data to figure out where and when, what, what those air tankers were actually doing. And this is an example of a map that he produced that kind of showed us, yeah, they seem to be picking up in lakes uh, and they seem to be dropping on a fire. So, so that was sort of proof of, of concept that, that he could parse the data in a meaningful way. And this is an example of some of the, the data. So, so basically this, this uh, graph shows the altitude and the speed of, of an air tanker over a 20 minute period. And if you see, Points A and E are where the air tanker is picking up water from a nearby lake. Uh, B is where it's arrived over the fire with a load of water. C is where it's dropped water on the fire. And D is where it's headed back. So we do think that uh, we've got a pretty good way of parsing this GPS data. Uh, what I'm looking for now is some smart uh, machine learning people to collaborate with, because I think we could do even better if we if we use this kind of data and analyze it using some machine learning uh, more sophisticated than the parsing algorithms that that Nick developed. So, how might we move forward? Well, obviously, there's a need for more field work to further understanding of fire suppression suppression processes. For example, the impact of air tanker drops on suppression operations. Uh, we need to start gathering, compiling, and analyzing more detailed fuel, weather, topography, fire behavior, values at risk, crew activity to develop improved suppression effectiveness models. Uh, we need to collect more of that data. We need to share it between organizations uh, because there's no sense in one province doing this alone. We need to educate train, hire, and support more fire management analytics specialists. Uh, we need to foster better collaboration between fire operations personnel and the fire management analytics specialists. And we need to support more interprovincial collaboration on the development, implementation, and maintenance of these air tanker management and, of course, other fire management decision support systems. And so a couple of closing remarks uh, for researchers who are interested in applied analytics research. Uh, my advice is get out into the field. That's where the decisions are being made. Sit quietly in the corner, watch, listen, ask questions at appropriate times, and don't get in the way. Uh, focus on the problems that managers want or need to have solved, not just what you as a researcher find interesting. Uh, focus on listening and learning, not marketing your research. For fire personnel that are interested in using analytics, open your doors to interested researchers. There's lots out there. Tell them what problems you want solved, but don't stifle. Some of them are going to work on problems that they're interested in their specialized expertise. May not solve your problems in the short term, but don't stifle that. 
that kind of research, provide data when asked, patiently answer their sometimes stupid questions, and provide honest and critical feedback. And, and I mentioned earlier that uh, Al Tithicott and I developed the model and uh, we ran it for a summer and they field tested it in one of the regional fire centers. And uh, at the end of the fire season, the duty officer said, well, that's nice, Dave, but call us when you've got a model that actually solves some of the more pressing problems that we have. So, you know, it's important, you know, don't don't be afraid as a as a fire manager to say, yeah, you've got cool research, but I need you, you know, your model's not good enough, so, so keep at it. Uh, so I've been interested in air tankers for a long time. That's me and my brother in front of, a, of an old cancel in uh, northern Quebec where I used to live. And, uh, but I'm not done yet. Uh, I have a whole lot of acknowledgements. I've been working on this stuff for a number of years and, and there's a handful of them. Uh, the NSERC has obviously supported my research program throughout my career, as has the Ministry of Natural Resources, and a lot of people working there as well, and students, and some of whom I missed. Obviously, I can't put them all up here. And I think I'm done. Comments, questions, and suggestions. For that, that was such a great presentation, and you covered such a, a broad range of timescales, which was really nice to see, which brings me to kind of my first question. And I believe that you answered this, but I'd like to circle back. Um, if you could pick one, one of those timescales that you talked about, whether it's the long term, the medium term and the short term um, for a wildfire management agency to look at and implement or focus on, which would you think would be their best choice? Uh, the best choice would would be I would ask them uh, because uh, you know as as a researcher, uh, me and my colleagues can can work on on any one of them, uh, some of them more productively than others. But but I would think uh, the, if if I were asked that question, I would I would by by an organization. I would go back to that organization. I would say, "What's most pressing for you?" So, so an organization that's that's uh, trying to upgrade its air tanker fleet is is going to be uh, interested in the long term strategic acquisition. Uh, an organization that's got a lot of air tankers and is not sure uh, where they should have their home bases might be interested in that. And and hopefully well, we can eventually. Uh, convince some organizations to come in and uh, start looking at the daily deployment. But but that's a very good question. But but uh, but where I asked by an organization, I would say, well, let's talk about what's going on in your organization and what you think are are the most challenging decision making problems that you have today. For sure, identify the problem, right? Yep. Um, Let them identify the problem. Yeah. I really like that. And I um, dare I say my favorite part was your last slide there talking about um, just suggestions to people in working in research who want to work in ops and people working in ops who want to collaborate with researchers, because quite often there can be what feels like a very large divide uh, between those two groups. And I think you gave some really solid suggestions. Yeah, I th there there is a divide, but but uh it depends on the people and the researchers i've uh i've been very fortunate throughout my career uh that uh whenever i reach out to people in the province of ontario from a research perspective their attitude is okay what can i do to help you uh and uh i've been very fortunate uh but you you have to work at that relationship uh, it takes time uh, you have to you have to work with people and you have to uh, generate some confidence. Uh, these people are busy. Uh, they they're they're uh, you know they they can't afford to spend a lot of time uh, working. You know they're, they're obviously interested in furthering basic science, but but uh, they 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 need to uh, like the rest of us. They got to ration their time so. So uh, they're, they're going to be most likely responsive if they feel that you're going to help them solve their real problems. Uh, but, but you have to work at it. 
So um, for everyone out there, please feel free to post any questions in the chat. I do have one um, question slash comment here from Marty regarding the recent Australian call for proposals. He's curious if perhaps they've forgotten about the 1996 CSIRO report by IT Loan and JS Gould resulting from Project Aquarius. Well, that's okay. quite interesting, Marty. And obviously, uh, I'm not surprised you brought that up because uh, Mike Watton and I were over at the prescribed burn in, 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 uh, in High Park yesterday. And, and that was exactly what he said. Not exactly the same words, but the same sentiment. So uh, uh, I don't have enough. I haven't been to Australia lately. I don't have enough contacts, but uh, I, I'm sure they, uh, you know, the Project Aquarius was a very important piece of research, but uh, obviously somebody down there thinks they need to do more. So I have a, another question here. Um, acknowledging that you've mentioned decision support tool adoption was limited in the context of air tanker management. Can you comment on decision support tool adoption in other areas of wildland fire management or even other areas of air tanker activity? Uh, well, I guess there hasn't been a lot. Uh, Dennis Boychuk and I were, 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 uh, we're successful in doing some work in Ontario and Dennis is continuing on with that. Rob McAlpine and, and, and Kelvin Hirsch did some. Uh, we, we, uh, we did some interesting work on air tanker home basing, but there is not a lot of this stuff that gets implemented. Uh, but there's another important point here and I didn't talk about it. Uh, when, when people say, you know, what what kind of impact have you had on on fire management? And obviously most of it's been on, in on the province of Ontario. And it's not just the models that we've developed that people use or don't use. I always say, and you know, people can challenge me on it, obviously. Uh, but but I say that that uh Perhaps our most important contribution, and when I say our, I'm talking about me and my and 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 my former students, and and the and the uh, fire people that I've been fortunate to collaborate with. I think our most important uh, contribution has been the development of a culture of decision analysis within the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario. So, so. Uh, it, it's very common and you'd have to talk to them, but I mean, I'm, I'm aware that they do this from time to time. So, so every once in a while, when they have what they consider to be an important problem, they say to themselves, we need to do some decision analysis. We need to do some analytics. We need to do some uh, rational analysis of alternatives. They don't involve me. They do it themselves. Uh, they've got some people that have that expertise so, so I think our most important contribution is, in fact, is not those particular studies we did, but helping develop that culture of decision analysis within Ontario's organization. And I'm sure that's happened to some extent in other organizations where other people have been collaborating with them. Thank you for that. So I've had another question come in. Um, with a move to using simulations and probabilistic fire occurrence predictions in your daily air tanker decision support tools, have you considered adapting these models to analyze or forecast air tanker performance in the future? Example, climate change scenarios. Uh, yes, actually, I didn't point, not me, but, but I pointed out that uh, uh, Rob McAlpine and Kelvin Hirsch extended the work that Dennis Boychuk and I did to develop leopards. And one of the things that they did was look at uh, projecting uh, air tanker use. Uh, I don't have it at my fingertips, but looking at air tanker use under climate change. So so yeah, most certainly when, whenever somebody has developed one of these models, ultimately the, 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 the engine has down there some predicted fire currents and and uh, air tanker needs. So to, to the extent that we can uh, look forward at the impact of climate change on those on those fires, then then we can look at the the uh, obviously the increasing need for air tankers. That's a very good question. Yes. But like I say, uh, I can get you a reference to that work that 
Kelvin and, and Rob did. Perfect, thank you. Um, oh, we've got a bunch coming in. Okay, what do you think is the biggest bottleneck to more analytics work for fire management? Money, time, researchers who want to work in fire management, fire management personnel who want to work with researchers or something else? Uh, probably a little bit of all of the above. Uh, there aren't a lot of analytics specialists working in fire. Uh, so that's certainly one of the problems. Uh, there, there have been an increasing number in, in recent years, and there's particularly people that are interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that's part of the problem. Uh, but you, you can't just you can't just pop in and say, hi, I'm I'm here from from the University of X, Y, Z, and I'm here to solve your problems because you, you, you need to develop a collaborative relationship with the, with the fire personnel so that you a develop some sort of an understanding of their decision making processes and and what they consider to be problems and you have to develop trust uh you know as i said earlier th these people are you know I, i'm sh i'm sure there's all kinds of fire personnel out there uh who uh were asked to collaborate in some research project and and uh, I don't I, ha I I don't know of any examples, so I should be careful how I say this. But 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 you hear stories of yeah, I helped this researcher out. They published their paper. I never heard from them again. Uh, so 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 you'd have to develop an ongoing relationship. You have to develop trust, and 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 you have to generate within that organization an appreciation for the strengths and weaknesses of the kind of research you do. So. So that they understand, oh, well, this person does this kind of research and they can solve these kind of problems, but they can't solve those. So basically, it takes years to develop that. So, so if you're thinking, for example, of an individual uh, graduate student who's going to do research, they're not going to be able to do that. But, but if they go to a lab where the, 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 the lab director has done that, then, then that person has paved the way for them to do that. But, but it's like, pay attention to the managers, the fire personnel. Just don't if the objective. If if the objective is just to publish a paper, fine, go on. But, but uh, if you want to do more with these people who have interesting, challenging problems, then pay attention to what their real needs and their understanding is. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, relationships and this, um, there's a really great switch going on right now to a KE culture, knowledge exchange culture, and um, that a recognition that it's not a one way street, right? It's exchange in both directions. And um, in my opinion, knowledge exchange can really only be successful when you have a fundamental relationship to support that. So I think those are, those are all really great points. Um, I have a bit of a hypothetical question for you here. Um, to those in ops looking into decision support tools, so not necessarily just air tanker um, decision support, but just in general, can you comment at all about potential risks of liability if the duty officer chooses to go against what the decision support tool is suggesting and things go south? Is that something that's been? Uh, that's an interesting question uh, that. Uh, uh... I never, never spent a lot of time thinking about it, actually, but but my answer would be, uh, it, it, uh, decision support systems are designed to inform decision making processes. That is, to provide the decision maker with information that will hopefully help him or her make better decisions. Decision support systems are not, nor should they be used to make recommendations. So, so uh, obviously I'm a researcher, I'm not a fire person, fire manager. Uh, if, if I had a decision-making problem and uh, uh, I had somebody develop a model and the model said X and I chose Y, then uh, I would probably, as a courtesy to that decision support person, 
explain why. Uh, and uh, I certainly wouldn't feel I would be liable because I didn't do what the computer model said. I don't think computer models are, 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 are any that good, but I guess to give you a specific example, uh, when, 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 you, when, when you develop decision support systems to recommend, for example, uh, this is what the model says is the is the best number of of this kind of air tanker that you should have in your province. Then then the uh, the fire personnel that are responsible for doing that kind of look at that as okay that model puts me in the ballpark. That tells me that that it's probably good to have a reasonable number of this kind of air tanker. So it's put me in the ballpark. Now what what they pay that person as the as the manager and the leader, the, this, and I'll hesitate to use the word big bucks, but 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 essentially they're responsible for making the ultimate decision, and 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 they know they know a lot more about the system than the people that develop those models, and they know more about the system than the model. So so it's, it's not so much that they're that they're making a decision that's counter to what the model suggested. It's like, okay, the model put me in this ballpark, but but I'm the person who really understands what's going on in this ballpark, and I'm going to pick this strategy over here, not the one that the model says. Perfect. That was actually kind of the answer I was looking for. <laughs> um, I, I think that's so great to talk about and realize that, you know, models are our models, their approximations, they're based on imperfect values, they're based on imperfect scenarios and an imperfect world. And they're not a self, it's not a self-driving car. Um, and there's just so much experience. And we talk about the file folders, especially in fire operations that people have in their brains that have years and years of experience and they can go back through and they have such an intuition about things that that can't necessarily be put into a model. So I think it's it's really nice to hear from someone who's building these tools that they're just another tool in your arsenal. They're not the be all end all. And, Most and certainly, I think, yep. Perfect. Yeah, I think you did a perfect job of explaining it. I, I see a couple more questions have come in. Um, one person is asking on the topic of decision making considerations. Is there any interest in integrating parts of this research into suppression leadership training for fire personnel? For example, should we be using strike range versus forecasted rate of spread in C2 for the day? Uh, that's a very good question. And, and, and the answer to which is, uh, I, I don't think, I don't think we have the infrastructure uh, in place, but hopefully we will soon to bring people that develop these decision support systems together with with people that are out there in the front line. So, for example, we we've got a really great infrastructure for for uh, teaching fire behavior uh, and for for training F bands. Uh, we don't have an equivalent infrastructure for. Uh, sharing and teaching knowledge about decision support systems. So, uh, I mean, one of my mandates with the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario is to help develop a curriculum. Uh, so so the reason they asked me to do that is because they recognize their need for that. So so that, that, that question is, uh, that's a very good question. And the answer is, uh, yes, we need to start putting some resources into developing uh, an infrastructure for sh for and I use the word two way sharing where where we bring people uh, that do this research together in sort of a teaching environment, uh, but I would call it a teaching and learning environment where they where they explain to the fire personnel what they've been doing and they listen to the fire personnel who critique their models uh, because. That in itself will lead to improve development of improved improved decision support systems. Thanks, Dave. Um, there's a comment here. Um, the participant is agreeing with you that decision support tools inform decision makers, but or sorry, should inform decision makers, but not make decisions. Um, this participant believes that sound decision support actually protects the government. Oh, it's all scrolling on me now. Protects the government from risk, unless, of course, they do something totally contradictory. Um, 
I have a question here. Should researchers expect decision makers automatically to trust new research models or should researchers expect decision makers to be skeptical? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good, it's not so much a question, it's an observation, most definitely. Uh, you know, when my colleagues and I develop a model, it's there's going to be various versions of it. Uh, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have it critiqued by the people for whom we think we developed it. But uh, no, you you can't trust these models out of the box uh, any more than you trust any other piece of applied science out of the box. And and if you and if you look at the time and effort and energy and resources that have been put into uh, fire behavior prediction, for example. Uh, it took a long time for for people to uh, accept the models that were developing the science that was developed. But at the same time, uh, as people, as fire behavior people were were sharing their knowledge with people, then people in the field were. And I didn't work. I don't work in that area. But I. But you know, obviously, I have friends that do, and I had the sense that that you know they uh, they listen to uh, critiques about how well, how well their models do and don't work. So, so no, you, you, should never, uh, you should never trust this science uh, without having it field tested, so to speak. It's just, you know, uh, you, you have no idea whether, whether the person that has developed that model is uh, really understands the system or not. So, so you actually have to, you know, support the development of it, and then you have to field test it. And, and the first time you field test this stuff, you're gonna find that, oh, uh, you didn't realize this goes on. Well, you need to put that in your model. So that's a very good question. Yeah, and being able to communicate it in a way that's digestible. Um, I know I call it, we get together with like our little nerd herd of researchers and we start talking in terms that mean nothing to someone outside of your specialty. So I think as a researcher, being able to communicate to different audiences in ways that are comfortable and familiar is also really important um, to get rid of that skepticism or not necessarily to get rid of it, to, but to um, have those conversations, like you said, where you get opportunities to field test and, and get proper feedback. Um, you need to be able to communicate in a comfortable fashion. Yeah, I mean, you got to get out there in the woods where things are going on. Like I, I, I've learned an enormous amount uh, sitting in the corner of the response center, uh, listening and watching what's going on. And when things are quiet or during coffee break, you ask somebody to explain why they did what they did. Or sitting in the back of a sitting in the back of a helicopter while a dip soup uh, or an ops chief briefs his or her div soup on the ground as they fly the fire. I mean, it's just, it, it takes time, but it's, but, you know, there, there, there isn't a forest fire suppression textbook that I'm aware of where, where you can learn this stuff. You got to get out there in the woods and uh, meet with people and find out what they do, why they do what they do and, and uh, what problems they think they would like solved and what problems you think you might help them solve. Mm -hmm. uh, this comment, I believe, is um, back when we were talking about decision support and training and not necessarily capacity and training to educate about decision support. And the comment is, what about the seminars carried out in BAMP? Uh, I'm not sure what seminars you're talking about. I've been to Burr's uh, I think Spurs, yeah. That's yeah. that's what I'm thinking. That's why I'm thinking it's tying back to the that topic. But um, Marty, if you want to um, either unmute or put in a bit more context, please feel free. Okay, while we wait to see if he types anything else. Um, does anyone else have any questions? We have about seven minutes left. You can either throw them in the chat. If you'd like to, you can unmute the BAMP Center. That's what Marty says. I'm still not 100% sure. Okay, so I, I, I can comment. I think I know what he's talking about. The, there are Burr's uh, workshops out there where 
researchers and, and a small number of operations people, fire personnel get together. Uh, and, uh, but, but, but it's a small group of people uh, and there's typically only a small number of operations people there because uh, there's just, it, it's a small working group that's, that tends to be focused on research. Uh, I, I think, I think what we need is, and, and, and I'm not surprised that, that Marty's interested in this because what we need is essentially a decision support system version of the kind of teaching and knowledge transfer and tech transfer that goes on with fire behavior knowledge. Uh, because, uh, you know, having a small group get together every three years at Banff is not going to solve this problem. It's going to enhance the kind of research that's done. But, but to the extent that we want to trans transfer this technology to agencies that want to use it, we, we need to develop, uh, uh, and I guess you use the term, knowledge exchange uh, processes that are going to make that possible. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that's sort of beyond my level of expertise, but I would say uh, uh, if, if, if there's somebody out there that, that feels they can develop the infrastructure for that kind of knowledge transfer, then I got a lot of friends that work on decision support systems that would happy to uh, tag their train, attach their, their car to that train. Thanks. Uh, this next question I, I really like, and I think it's, um, it draws attention really nicely to how sometimes, I talked about how there can be a perceived disconnect between research and operations. And I think um, this question words it quite eloquently, research on practical or apply problems is valuable for fire management agencies. But is there opportunity for researchers to make cutting edge contributions that are valued in the academic world? Well, it depends on the academic world that you live in. Uh... I was educated as an industrial engineer. Uh, I have been supported throughout my career by the industrial engineering uh, research committee, uh, which has since been expanded for NSERC. Uh, they, uh, they, they value applied research. Uh, they basically like it, like basically they judge my work like everybody else's. Uh, when when I go to apply for research grants, they want to know where I'm publishing my uh, papers and that they're being published in uh, in highly ranked journals. Uh, but they're not opposed to applied research. If you can do applied research and and uh, get it published in good journals, then uh, then you get brownie points and you get research grants. Uh, I don't know to what you know. I, I I outlined those four areas of of uh, my sort of view of four areas of of fire research. I I don't know to what extent uh, the 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 gatekeepers in those areas value applied research, but uh, certainly in the fire management systems area, then uh, then they they do value applied research. It's it's. Uh, and and I've never had any trouble with that, and I have colleagues that don't have any trouble with that. You, you have to be you have to be making, uh, you know, when you go apply for your research grants, you got to be showing your 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 graduating students. You got to be making contributions that are published in recognized journals, and and if you can show them that you've also people have been uh, implementing your stuff, you get you get a gold star. But but it's not always easy. It takes. You know, I, I I could sit in my office and and spin out theoretical papers. Uh, I could probably spin out five times as many as as I did if if I uh, just worked on theoretical problems. Uh, and and I appreciate that people want to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I in particular though want to work on. I I mean I want to work on problems that I think people are going to use uh and and uh yeah i won't go into personal stories but but uh when, when i find somebody who says oh i've actually used your stuff like you know that's worth more than uh, a couple of 
of pub publications to me, but but everybody has their own reward system. Uh, you, you, you know, yeah, good question. Thank you. Not for a simple that. answer to a difficult problem. No, and I would I would even hazard to say it um, probably very much depends on where the researcher is in their life cycle. Um, you know, if you're in a position where you're trying to put in a tenor application, number of papers, each factor, it's um, it's probably going to be a little bit of a different scenario than someone who's well established in their field with lots of um, a strong network and links to different partners and stuff, right? Very much so. And I, you know, like the 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 number of papers that are required to to get you tenure these days is. Uh, considerably more than were required to get me tenure. I mean, I could spend, I could afford to spend time out in the, out in the woods, uh, listening and watching people. Uh, you're, you're quite right. If I was scrambling for tenure, I probably couldn't do that these days. Well, Dave, I really want to thank you for this. It was a great presentation and I feel like the Q&A was equally as informative. Um, I'd like to be respectful of everyone's time. It is 11 o'clock, so I'm going to cut off the Q&A here. If anyone has any further questions for Dave, are you okay if I post your email in the chat, Dave? Yeah, most certainly go ahead and do that. Okay, um, I'm just going to stick it in here. Um, you can also send them to wildfire at ualberta.ca and we can make sure they get forwarded on to Dave. Um, for anyone who's still here, I can see people are leaving. If you have a topic or a presenter you'd like to hear about or hear from, please let us know wildfire at ualberta.ca and hopefully we'll see you next month in May for Burn P3 Plus with Chris Stockdale. Thanks everyone.